Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's web interface support call for ACOs, groups, and virtual groups. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session where attendees will have an opportunity to ask questions via phone in the support call questions box. And CMS subject matter experts will address as many questions as time allows. Also to note, a recording and slide deck from today's call will be posted on the QPP webinar library within the next two weeks. Now I'll turn it over to Lisa Marie Gomez at CMS to begin. Thank you. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today as groups, virtual groups, and ACOs prepare for quality reporting. Again, I'm Lisa Marie Gomez from CMS. Joining me today on the call are other CMS experts and contractors who will share helpful information on the CMS Up interface, quality reporting, and answer your questions following today's presentation. Today's support call will only focus on 2022 CMS Web Interface Quality Reporting. You can contact the Quality Payment Program Service Center with any of your questions regarding cost, cloning interoperability, improvement activities, MIPS, or quality reporting in general. Today's slide deck, recording, and transcript will be available on the QPP webinar library within the next two weeks. Next slide, please. This is a disclaimer slide regarding this presentation. Information in this presentation is current at the time of its publication, but I urge you to please be sure that you're using the source documents and links that are provided throughout the presentation, and please stay tuned to any communication from the Quality Payment Program or the Medicare Shared Savings Program regarding any updated information. Next slide, please. Now I will review announcements and reminders. Next slide, please. The CMS Web Interface will close at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on March 31st, 2023. Your submission will be automatically accepted at submission, at, as submission closes. As a reminder, the CMS Web Interface is accessible using the sign-in link on the Quality Payment Program website. 2022 is the final performance period for MIPS groups, virtual groups, and APM entities participating in MIPS to report using the CMS Web Interface. Transition resources are, are available on the QPP Resource Library and the QPP Webinar Library. The CMS Web Interface will remain an available collection type only for Medicare Sh Shared Savings Program, ACOs, reporting via the APM Performance Pathway, or the APP, for the 2023 and the 2024 performance period. Next slide, please. Here is a list of upcoming support calls. The support call, the next support call will be held Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023 from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Topics will include frequently asked measure questions for the following measures. PREV-10, preventative care and screening, tobacco use, screening and cessation intervention. And CARE-2, falls, screening for future fall risk. Additional topics may be added prior to the support call. Next slide, please. The CMS Web Interface API is available all year for testing in the developer preview environment. Please review the links listed here for more information. Now I will turn the presentation to Steven Salega to review the updates to the CMS Web Interface Excel template on the QPP resource library. Next slide, please. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So there were some updates that, were, that occurred over um, since the beginning of the posting from November. Uh, so we just wanted to walk through what has been updated to make sure that there are no concerns um, with the data. If there are any questions about the measure, um, we always do defer to the measure specification, um, but to walk through what we have updated. So, so the first issue was with CARE 2 within the patient list tab. Um, we have updated the fact that there are no denominator exclusions for that measure. Um, so that value was not valid. That has been removed out of the, um, the patient tab with the template with, or with, with data. Um, also on the help section of that, um, it included the denominator exclusion, which was removed out. Um, and we 
remove the language around excluding patients for the non-ambulatory during the measurement period as the exclusion is no longer valid for care two. Um, again, this is only for the templates that exist on the resource library, the data that um, is downloaded from the actual web interface and production um, had the correct information as well as the correct values available for reporting. Uh, next slide, please. For prep, prep seven, there was an update for the Excel template with the sample data. Um, there was a column that was removed as it did not align with the specifications um, and then was also updated for the patient receiving the influenza immunization um, for the time period that was available to reflect uh, the performance year 22 time period instead of the performance year uh, 20 time period. Uh, and then for PREV10, it was updated for uh, the text column in BV row two regarding the measurement period. Um, again, it was updated to reflect for performance year 22 instead of performance year 21. Uh, so that information is correct and you will see the correct information in those um, the template as well as the template with, with data on the resource library. Uh, next slide, please. And the last measure that was updated was um, an issue in the patient list for the Excel template um, with sample data where there was information about the um, LDLC and measurement that was no longer included. Um, so that was removed out. For, for both of them um, and now is correctly reflecting the information in alignment with the measure specifications for um, all of the measures that are in the web interface in combination with the, um, the template as well as the template with sample data. And I will pass it back over. Um, those are all of the updates that we made to both of those. Hi, this is Angie from the PIMS team uh, to go over the frequently asked measure questions. Next slide, please. Um, the first slide is regarding PREV12, um, the preventative care and screening, screening for de depression and follow-up plan measure. Um, the question is, should a patient that was diagnosed with depression or bipolar disorder during the performance period be included in the denominator exclusion? Um, the answer would be no. The denominator exclusion is assessed prior to any encounter during the measurement period. A diagnosis of depression or bipolar disorder during the measurement period wouldn't be considered a denominator exclusion. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is for DM2, the diabetes hemoglobin A1C poor control greater than 9%. Um, the intent of the measure is patients 18 to 75 years of age with diabetes that have a more recent heap or most recent hemoglobin A1C greater than nine during the measurement period. Um, I just want to mention that a, a um, this is an inverse measure. Um, so a lower A1C would be the desired performance. Um, and as for telehealth for DM2, um, the documentation of the most recent HbA1c result may be completed during a telehealth encounter. Next slide, please. Um, the first question for DM2 is, will patients only be included in the measure if they have a diagnosis of diabetes during the measurement year, or will they be included if they have a prior diagnosis but no diagnosis in the measurement year. Uh, the answer is there must be medical record documentation the patient has an active diagnosis of diabetes either during the measurement period or during the year prior to the measurement period to be included in the 2022 CMS web interface DM2 measure. Number two, can the results of an A1C home test kit that is patient reported be included in the numerator? The answer is no, don't include HbA1c levels reported directly by the patient in this scenario. 
the measure steward removed the option of using patient reported HbA1c values to meet the numerator as identified in the calendar year 2022 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule. Please refer to the numerator guidance in the 2022 CMS Web Interface DM2 measure specification for additional information on numerator submission. Question three, will HbA1c results from any setting be acceptable for the numerator for the 2022 performance period? The answer is yes. The measure doesn't limit the numerator to a specific setting. If the HbA1c test results in the medical record, the test can be used to determine numerator compliance. Next slide, please. Question four is, are continuous glucose monitoring system results acceptable for the numerator? The answer is no. The measure doesn't include CGM results to meet performance for the measure. Report the most recent HbA1c value documented in the medical record. Documentation must include a distinct numeric HbA1c result and the date the blood was drawn. Question five. For the 2022 CMS Web Interface DM2 measure, do I use the date the blood was drawn or the date of the lab results? Um, it is appropriate to use the following priority ranking as shown in the denominator guidance in the measure specifications for the 2022 CMS Web Interface DM2 measure. Um, the priority is the lab report draw date would be your first option, then lab report date, then flow sheet documentation, then practitioner notes, and then other types of documentation. And you can find that in the specifications. Next slide, please. This is for the PREV-13 statin therapy for the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. The intent of the measure is for patients who are considered high risk of cardiovascular events to be prescribed or taking statin therapy during the measurement period. Documentation of statin therapy prescribed or being taken during the measurement period can be completed during a telehealth encounter. Next slide, please. Okay, question one is, is documentation of hypercholesterolemia alone sufficient to confirm a diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia for population two in the 2022 CMS Web Interface PREP 13 measure? Uh, the answer is no. If hypercholesterolemia alone is present and there's no other documentation to support familial hypercholesterolemia, it wouldn't be appropriate to confirm the patient in the denominator for population two. On the contrary, if hypercholesterolemia is present in the medical record, along with documentation supporting familial hypercholesterolemia, it would be appropriate to confirm that patient for the denominator of population two. Question two, can a diagnosis of pure hypercholesterolemia still be used to confirm the patient in denominator population two? Uh, the answer is no, pure, pure cholesterol, pure hypercholesterolemia was removed from the denominator criteria for population two for the 2022 performance period. A diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia is required. Next slide, please. What does the denominator exception need? When does the denominator exception need to be documented in the medical record? Uh, there must be medical record documentation during the measurement period that the reason a statin wasn't prescribed was due to an applicable denominator exception. Documentation should support that the denominator exception is active during the measurement period. For more specific information, refer to the numerator submission guidance in the posted 2022 CMS Web Interface PREV 13 measure specifications. Question four, is it correct that population three no longer requires an LDLC value, but does require a diagnosis for diabetes? The answer is yes. Population three was updated to only include patients aged 40 to 
to 75 years of age with type 1 or 2 diabetes. Population 3 no longer includes an associated, an associated LDLC result. Uh, question 5. If a patient is confirmed in the denominator population but refuses the prescription of statin medication, would the patient then be considered performance not met? Um, the answer is to meet the intent of the measure, there must be medical record documentation that the statin therapy was prescribed during the measurement period. However, uh, the patient's adherence to statin therapy is not included in the 2022 CMS web interface PREV 13 measure. And thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Lisa Marie Gomez with CMS. Great, thank you so much, Angie, for those frequently asked questions. Next slide, please. So I just wanna highlight that, you know, the various resources that are available for the, the CMS web interface. So here you can see these are all of the documents that relate to the CMS web interface. So we highly encourage you to review these materials as you prepare and submit data for 2022 performance period. Next slide, please. For those transitioning to another collection type for the 2023 performance period and beyond, resources are available in the QPP Resource Library and QPP Webinar Library. So we encourage you to review those materials as you prepare to transition to a new collection type. Next slide, please. Finally, this slide contains links to resources available for the Medicare Shared Savings Program, ACOs. We encourage you to review the materials available here for more information. Next slide, please. If you have other questions or need assistance relating to other items that are not discussed in this presentation, we encourage you to contact the Quality Payment Program and the information to contact the Quality Payment Program Service Center is available on this slide. And also, if you have questions relating to the Shared Savings Program that weren't specified in this presentation, please reach out to the, the Shared Savings Program using the email address listed on this slide. Next slide, please. Now I will turn the presentation over to Olivia so we can begin the Q&A portion of the presentation. Great, thank you, Lisa Marie. Um, and as Lisa Marie just mentioned, we are now going to start the Q&A portion of today's webinar. A quick reminder, you can ask questions via the Q&A box, and we have seen some come through already, so thank you for that. Um, but you can also ask questions via the webinar audio. And in order to do that, please go ahead and click that raise hand button and we will unmute your line so you can speak. And we have seen a few questions, um, just folks asking about the recording and slides from the last webinar and that those will be posted within the next um, day or two on the QPP webinar library. Okay, we will get started with some questions that we have seen come in through the Q&A box. Um, Deb, this question is for you. Uh, for CARE 2 numerator, a GATE or balance assessment meets the intent of the measure. Therefore, would progress notes that say a variation of the following? GATE normal, GATE intact, stable GATE, or NL GATE be adequate as a GATE or balance assessment? Thank you. Um, the CARE 2 measure specification does define a screening for future fall risk as an assessment of whether an individual has experienced a fall or problems with gait or balance. If your medical record documentation supports that the patient was assessed for problems with gait or balance, then the intent of the measure has been met. If, however, you are unsure if the documentation you are referencing meets the denominator requirements, it may be necessary to confirm with the clinician. Um, you can reference page eight of the measure specifications, which do provide the following guidance. Um, a gate or balance assessment meets the intent of the measure. Um, and also you could refer to page five of the CARE 2 Falls Screening for Future Fall Risk measure specifications for additional guidance. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And moving on to the next question, for PREV-12 depression screen, if a patient is diagnosed with depression or bipolar on the date of the most recent depression screen in 2022, do they qualify for the exclusion? Hi, this is Katie. So um, in regard to the denominator exclusion timing, um, there is a note on page nine in the specification under denominator guidance. And that is that the denominator exclusion should be prior to any encounter during the measurement period. So this truly means prior to any encounter. It's looking for a history of um, depression or bipolar. And those patients that have previously been diagnosed would be excluded from the measure because the intent of this measure is to screen and identify patients who were newly diagnosed and for those patients to have a follow-up plan documented if the, the screening is positive. I also want to add um, that if the patient is diagnosed with depression or bipolar during the measurement period, then it wouldn't be considered an applicable exclusion. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question for PREV-12 depression screen, Will CMS accept a PHQ2 equals zero as negative? In the past, it was considered negative. This is Katie again. So when submitting data through the CMS web interface, the expectation is that the medical record documentation demonstrates each component of the measure specification has been met. So that includes that the patient met denominator criteria, the numerator quality action was performed and any applicable denominator exclusions or exceptions um, existed. So how specifically that's documented in your system is up to your organization. However, it does need to support the information you report. So we can't provide specific feedback as to whether or not certain documentation in the medical record would suffice or meet the intent of the measure. Um, again, it would be up to the organization to ensure that their documentation supports the information reported. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And one more for you um, for PREV-12. When they have depression and anxiety code F41.8, does that count as depression? Sure. And um, there's been a few... Um, coding question similar to this um, coming through, and I think this is in relation to um, the denominator exclusion codes. Um, so in that instance, um, we would refer you to the PREV-12 coding document in the denominator exclusion codes tab um, to guide um, you there. But also, um, as long as your medical record documentation supports um, the diagnosis of depression or bipolar, um, then it would be appropriate to report. Thank you. Perfect. And Deb, a question for you. For measure HTN2, if patient is skipped via CMS claims due to a diagnosis in prior years for CKD5, but current medical records indicates the patient is now CKD4, would it be appropriate to remove the skip and submit final blood pressure for this patient? And this is Deb. Um, you should really be looking at the, the patients based on information that you have for this year, not for previous years. So what you want to do is ensure that you can confirm um, the proper diagnosis as defined within the specification and then just move on from, from that point. So again, don't use prior skip request or skips that you may have had. Um, look at the information you have for this particular year. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And Katie, going back to you, we did get a question for PREV 13. Is pure hypocholesteremia not a considered an applicable diagnosis per the PY 2022 performance specification encoding document. 
So um, this is related to population two of PREV 13 and the measure specifications for 2022 are specific to patients who have an active, or excuse me, um, who are previously diagnosed with or currently have an active diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. So your documentation would need to support the diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. Thank you. Great, thank you. And it looks like we do have some folks with their hand raised. So we'll switch over to the phone lines um, for just a few minutes. And Rick Bukowski, we will unmute your line and you can ask your question. And you may need to unmute on your end as well. And Rick, it looks like you're still muted on your end. We'll give it just another second for you to unmute. Okay, we will move on to Chantel. Chantel Burke, we will unmute your line and you can go ahead and ask your question. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Great. Um, this is about the PrEP 12 measure. It seems like we're just, I understand that you want us to refer to the specifications, um, especially when uh, PHQ2, like both questions are answered no. Our physicians are basically saying that, you know, I'm not going to write the word negative if the questions are answered no and the score is a zero because there is an assumption of it being negative. And I feel like, in the past, we've been able to get that confirmation that if a patient's PHQ2 has both questions answered no and the score is zero, realizing that this is not a score-based measure, um, I just don't want to be failing people when you know they're actually documenting the record, doing the screening, but they just don't have the word negative in there. Is it just basically the interpretation that two, but that both questions answer zero is equal to a negative? Hi, this is Katie. So um, again, I don't think this is something that we can speak specifically to in that your documentation just needs to support the information that you reported. So how okay. specifically that's reflected in your medical record documentation is yeah. truly up to your organization as long as you're able to, you know, support the yep. way in which you've reported that in the web interface. Okay, great. I appreciate that. And, and what we're doing is just in our documentation, we're just making those notes because that's what we're being told by the practices. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. It doesn't look like anyone else has their hand raised. So again, if you do want to ask a question via the phone line, please go ahead and raise your hand. But for now, we will switch back over to questions submitted. Um, Angie, this is a question for you about PREV-6. Please define current. If they were told to come back in three years, do we look at the date or is current defined as 10 years? Hi. Um, I'm assuming that you are referring to a colonoscopy um, because in the me measure specifications, um, uh, appropriate screening for that would be during the measurement period or the previous nine years. Um, so as long as you have documentation that the patient did have that colonoscopy um, during that time period, that would meet performance. Um, I, I do acknowledge that um, there was direction for the patient to return in three years, but according, you would just go by, according to the measure specifications, the numerator guidance that that says, uh, that defines current colorectal cancer screenings. And for colonoscopy, it is um, a 10 year period. So thank you. Thank you. Jamie, a question for you. For PREV 7, there is medical documentation that the patient permanently refused the vaccine during the 2022 flu season. Would this count as a patient refusal? Would the provider need to redocument this refusal every year? 
Hi, this is Jamie. Um, thanks for this question. And just as Katie has indicated, we're really unable to speak specifically to how that information should be reflected in your medical record. Um, and measure specification doesn't provide that guidance as much as like how to document it either. So as Katie has said to same answer, um, however you report that medical record just really needs to support what we're finding when you submit that data. So really basically the same response Katie's given. And John, I did provide a similar answer within your service now inquiry this morning. By all means, please feel free to reopen that question if you need additional clarification. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. And Deb, going back to you, um, a question that says, can a fall risk assessment be completed in the ER? Um, yes, a falls risk assessment can certainly be completed in an ER. Um, if you were to look at the posted specification, there is guidance um, as referred to earlier on page eight that um, the setting of the screening is not restricted to an office setting. So as long as your medical record documentation supports that a falls risk assessment has been completed, then um, the intent of the measure has been met. Thank you. Thank you. And Lisa Marie, a question for you. Can you please confirm the Excel template downloaded from the CMS portal is up to date? My PREV 7 date is correct in my original template from the portal on January 3rd, 2023. Yes, thanks for that question. So I just want to highlight that there are two Excel templates relating to the CMS web interface. The first one is the CMS web interface Excel template. And then there's the CMS web interface Excel template with sample data. So I just want to highlight that when we posted those documents and then we reposted them with the updates, the updated, so right now we just encourage you if you can go to our website um, and we'll post the links in the chat here. Um, but we just recommend that you download these documents as these are the most up-to-date templates that you will utilize. Some of the changes that were made were made just maybe just to one, maybe just the Excel template versus the Excel template with sample data. So you may see that if you downloaded the document and we, we mentioned you know exactly what was changed it may not have been to one of the documents so i just want to also highlight that we're going to be sending an email to all web interface users meaning those who are um, for groups and virtual groups who are registered and then all aco um, participants but you will receive an email and we will specifically outline which document or which excel spreadsheet included specific changes and we will highlight when those changes were made because we noted we, when we posted the new templates, it was on a specific date. So we will provide all that information. I know some are trying to take screenshots of the information, but I want to highlight we will be sending an email to everyone so you have all the information relative to the changes made and exactly which document included those changes. So we rest assured you will know exactly what was changed. And again, we'll send that, send that out. So stay tuned for that email. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Um, we do have one person with their hand raised. Uh, Laura Bisk, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you clearly. All right, perfect. So I have a patient with a problem list um, encounter for palliative and it's not resolved. Does that mean they can be counted as an exclusion for palliative care? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So um, for patients who receive palliative care during the measurement period, um, you would those would be considered um, not qualified for sample. So if they received palliative care at any point during the measurement period, then you would um, not confirm them in your patient sample. But do they have to have a visit documented as like a progress note within that within that calendar year or does having an encounter code with palliative suffice 
Um, generally, for the web interface, coding alone isn't considered sufficient documentation. You would need additional medical record documentation to support um, the information that is being reported. Thank you. Great, and we have one more person um, with their hand raised, PMC Klain. We have unmuted your line and you can ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, for the depression remission measure, if the diagnosis code for an encounter is within the specifications, so for example, F32.9, is that acceptable verification of an active diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia, despite the fact that the verbiage in the encounter says reactive depression? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, it may be best if you would submit a uh, service now ticket so that we can look into this, but I would need to look at the coding document. So um, if it is included in the coding document for that measure, then it would be included. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and send that in in addition. Um, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Great. Getting back over to some questions in the Q&A box. Katie, a question for you on PREV 12. What PHQ number is considered positive? So the measure specification doesn't provide guidance as to what score is uh, positive or negative. Um, so I believe that the tool itself would provide that guidance. And then it would also be up to um, the clinician interpretation of the results and their interaction with that patient. So we can't provide specific guidance as to whether a certain score would be considered positive or negative. That would really be up to the clinician to determine and document. Thank you, Katie. And Joyce, a question for you. Would this be the same on the enhanced track where we need to perform at 30th percentile or higher? Sure, and my colleague Kara Sokol will answer this. Yes, can you repeat the question? Yes, would this be the same on the enhanced track where we need to perform at 30th percentile or higher? Yes, the scoring methodology with relation to using the 30th percentile does not vary based on which track in which the ACO participates. We would also note that under the EUC policy that is in effect for performance year 2022, ACOs that report quality data via the APP and meet MIPS data completeness and case minimum requirements will receive the higher of their ACOs quality performance category score or the 30th percentile category score. ACOs that are unable to report quality data via the APP will have the score set equal to the 30th percentile category score. Thank you. Thank you. In a question on PREV 13, does documentation of a patient's refusal to take a statin fall in the exceptions for PREV 13? So patient refusal is not an applicable exclusion or exception for PREV 13. Um, it's really those that are specific to the reasons listed within the measure specification. Um, and then just to reiterate that this measure does not assess patient adherence to a statin. So as long as there's documentation um, that a patient was um, prescribed a statin, whether they adhere to actually taking it, that would meet the intent of the measure. 
um, but there's no exclusion um, for patient refusal. Thank you. Great, thank you. And the next question, did I hear correctly that ACOs will be allowed to submit quality versus CMS web interface for uh, performance year 2023 and 2024? Hi, this is Lisa Marie. I'd like to answer that question. So as indicated um, during the presentation, we noted that the 2022 performance period is the last performance period in which the web interface is available for groups and virtual groups. For ACOs reporting via the APP, the web interface is still available as a collection type through the 2023 and the 2024 performance period. So it's still available for the next two years, but for groups and virtual groups that are participating in MIPS, the 2022 performance period is the last submission period, I mean, the last performance period in which it's available. Thank you, Lisa Marie. And Kara, a question for you is CMS planning to conduct random quality submission audits for ACO quality reporting this year? Thank you. Uh, CMS continually evaluates the impact of the COVID-19 public health emergency on shared savings program ACO's quality reporting. CMS will review the data reported by ACOs via the web interface for 2022 to determine if any data anomalies would require CMS to look at the data more closely via an audit. After completing this review, CMS may opt against conducting a QMV audit for 2022. However, CMS retains the right to ask for additional information for ACOs or to conduct a targeted audit if egregious data anomalies are found. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on, we did get a question on PREV6. For a patient reported result, does the result test and year of test count? Does the month need to be reported as well? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, the, so on page nine in the numerator guidance of the PREV6 measure specifications, there is um, guidance for patient reported requirement. And they it does state that the date and in parentheses year and type of test and result fi or findings uh, must be documented in the medical record for patient reported. Um, so the year alone is fine uh, due to the fact that the um, measure specifications define appropriate colorectal cancer, sc cancer screenings, and like an FOBT is during the measurement year. So as long as you have the year for that one, and then they go up in years, uh, they're forward for different types of tests. So year is fine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And then shifting back over to the phone line, Miriam, we have unmuted your line and you just need to unmute and you're in and you can go ahead and ask your question. Great, can you hear me? Can you, can you yeah, hear me? Okay? Can. You can't hear me. So oh, you did hear me. Hello? 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 Sorry. Mm -hmm. Why don't you hear we are able to hear you. Okay, we will move on. Mary Yakish, your um, line is unmuted and you can go ahead and ask your question. And Mary, you are muted on your end. So you just need to unmute your computer and then you should be able to ask your question. I'm good, it was already answered, thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, moving back to some other questions we received. Um, one question reads, can you confirm 
reporting versus performance measures for 2022. I was understanding it was depression remission, statin therapy, and depression screening. Uh, hi, this is Prince from RTI. Uh, the depression remission or MH1 measure and the statin therapy or PrEP 13 measure are the only measures that will not be scored for performance year 2022. The screening for depression and follow-up plan measure was retroactively set to have flat percentage benchmarks. So that measure will be scored for performance year 2022. Great. And a question, it looks like it's a follow-up to um, a previous question. And Miriam, this might have been the question that you are raising your hand for, but are you saying that for familial hypercholesterolemia needs to be documented by narrative in addition to the diagnosis code? Hi, this is Katie. Um, so to clarify, um, Coding alone isn't sufficient documentation um, when reporting through the CMS web interface. So um, you can use the coding as a reference. However, your medical record documentation needs to support um, the appropriate diagnosis or other components of the measure specification. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, and another question, is someone able to better explain how CMS defines exclusion and exception? Hi, it's Katie again. <laughs> um, so in our um, web interface FAQ document on the QPP resource library, there is a section on page 13 that outlines the differences between um, a denominator exclusion or exception. Um, so if you want to take a look at that for a little bit more detail, um, but just quickly here, I'll cover those as well. So a denominator exclusion is patients who should be removed from the measure population and denominator before determining whether the numerator criteria are met. If a patient meets the denominator exclusion criteria, they must be removed from the population. This patient will be replaced with the next consecutive patient sampled for the measure. A denominator exception is when a patient is eligible for the denominator, but the measure specifications define circumstances in which a patient may be appropriately deemed as a denominator exception. There are three general categories of allowable reasons. These include medical, patient, or system, um, and each of these are specific to um, the measure itself. So we do recommend that you take a look at each specification to determine um, which, if any, are applicable. So a denominator exception would remove the patient from performance denominator only if the numerator criteria aren't met as defined by the exception. And this allows for the exercise of clinical judgment by the MIFT eligible clinician. When a denominator exception is selected, the patient is considered completed for reporting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question for HTNT, HTN2, if the last appointment of the year is with a specialist and a blood pressure isn't taken, do we report that visit and that no blood pressure was taken or do we look for the last appointment where blood pressure was documented and report that one? And thank you for that question. A couple of things I do want to note, um, certainly specialist visits are applicable to report the hypertension to measure to have that blood pressure um, if it is documented count. However, as you indicated in your question, there was no blood pressure taken on that day. Um, so if you were to look at page 10 of the posted measure specification, you should be determining if the patient's most recent blood pressure was documented during the measurement period. So you are going to start with the most recent blood pressure documented within the medical record um, for, for that measure once you've determined denominator eligibility and you're moving into the submission guidance for the numerator. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one person with their hand raised. Lisa Burry, we have unmuted your line. So you'll just need to unmute on your end and you can ask your question. 
Hi, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Um, I think uh, they just kind of uh, explained it, but I just wanted to ask with telemed, uh, if the last blood pressure with a PCP was a telemed visit and the patient does not have a digital device for blood pressure collection, can we use the in-office blood pressure with a PCP from a previous visit? I think what many folks are getting confused about is that the last blood pressure of the year, um, and if it's not assessed with a specialist or a PCP, in this case, uh, telemed, would count as not screening. So I think you explained that pretty well, that we would look for the last blood pressure that was assessed within the performance period. So please uh, uh, expound on that for us. Appreciate it very much. Sure, absolutely. Um, the one thing I do want to note is that you shouldn't be including blood pressures taken by the patient using a non-digital device, such as with a manual blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope. So if the blood pressure that you're seeing documented in the medical record is one that should not be used per the specification, you would, you, you would look for the next most recent documented blood pressure. Um, again, it, the, the blood pressure should not be skipped if it's documented because it was at a specialist per se, um, but it is important to ensure that, that you're, you're both, in, you know, you've, you've confirmed your denominator eligibility and then the blood pressure that you are looking at, especially if it was a telemed um, blood pressure that's been documented, if it is one that you're confirming um, that the patient was using a non-digital device, then that would not, not meet the intent of the measure. And you would want to look in that case for the next most recent documented blood pressure. Does that help? Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. And Miriam, we have unmuted your line so you can ask your question. Hi, yes, I was wondering if the um, those measures that have the denominator, ex denominator exclusions for fragility, the codes that are in the um, coding document, are those all inclusive for fragility or advanced illness? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, yes, they are, they are meant to be all inclusive. Um, Oops, I'm thinking. Um, you can look at the coding in, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat that for me again? I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I'm telling you correctly. Sure. I just wanted to make sure on the uh, coding documents on the codes for fragility or advanced illness, are those all inclusive? We have a couple of patients that would meet the require would meet the criteria, but our codes are not in there. There are maybe a one or two off uh, numerals off. Um, you know, I see. whether it be like weakness or um, I can't even think of the other one. But one of them was weakness and maybe dizziness or um, something along those lines. But they're right. not in the documents and so I didn't know if if that was all inclusive okay uh yes it is for the exclusions um so the code would need to be in the coding document under um there are codes for frailty and advanced illness and so it would need to be included in the coding document in order to exclude the patient okay thank you, thank you so much uh-huh Great. Um, shifting back to some written questions that we have received. Um, this question reads, for patients in our sample list that live out of state and only seen for one visit within our system, typically in urgent care or a walking clinic, how should they be counted or skipped? Yes, this is Kara with RTI. By virtue of being sampled into the CMS web interface, CMS has identified claims for these patients submitted by your ACO. In order to be chosen for the web interface sample, these patients 
each have had at least two eligible services with your ACO during the measurement period. CMS expects organizations to be able to obtain medical records for these patients, including collaborating with physicians, staff, or facilities inside and outside of the ACO. There is an option within the web interface to select medical record not found. However, that should only be used if there's truly an inability to locate and access the patient's medical record. Thank you. Thank you. And Jamie, a question for you. If a provider is noting for tobacco use in his note reviewed, no change patient was identified as non-smoker in previous years, would we be able to note that they were screened and followed through the measure or do we mark them as not screened? Hi, thanks for this question. As long as the patient is screened within the measurement period and when you're looking at those medical records, you can suffice or determine whether or not the patient is tobacco user versus a non-user, then you would meet that screening portion of the measure. Thanks for the question. Thank you. A question for Prev 12, if a doctor has charted in 2020 that a patient has a medical reason for not being screened for depression, does the doctor have the chart have to chart this again specifically in 2022 in order for it to be applicable as a denominator exception for reporting in measurement year 2022? Hi, so if you take a look at the um, submission guidance on page 16 of the PREV 13, um, oh, apologies, sorry. Can you repeat if this was for PREV 12 or PREV 13? I'm sorry. PREV 12. Okay, um, sorry for that. Um, just taking a look at the specs here really quickly. Um, so the denominator exception um, timing for this one is specified. This would be page 10 of the PREV 12 measure specification in the submission guidance. So um, the denominator exception timing is during the encounter during the measurement period. So previous documentation of um, a patient refusal wouldn't be appropriate. It would need to be specific to um, the performance period and the encounter um, during the performance period for that specific patient. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Angie, a few questions for you. The first one says, if a patient passed during the measurement year, is it required that the exclusion is reported? Hi, um, I just wanna clarify um, in this question, it says that the patient passed and I am not sure if that means passed away <laughs> or passed the measure. So I'll just give both answers. Um, if the patient passed away during the measurement period, then they would be removed during patient confirmation and not qualified for sample. If they passed the measure, in other words, the quality action was completed for the measure and documented, um, but the patient did meet the criteria for an exclusion, as Katie um, explained earlier, that if patients, patients should be removed from the measure population and denominator before determining whether the numerator is met. So if they do meet the exclusion, they must be removed from the measure. I hope that answers that. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question for depression remission, would dementia be considered an exclusion? Hi, um, no. It is not included uh, in the list of coding in the coding document. So again, you'd want to check those denominator exclusion codes um, on the MH1 coding document for uh, coding for those conditions. They're also listed on the first page of the measure specifications under denominator exclusions. Um, and that's patients with a diagnosis of bipolar, disorder, personality, select personality disorders, schizophrenia or psychotic disorder, pervasive developmental disorder, patients who were permanent nursing home residents or patients with a diagnosis of personality disorder 
emotionally lab labial. Um, so yes, uh, their dementia is not included. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, shifting to a question about PREV 13, denominator exception, if a patient has statin noted an allergy on their allergy problem list in the EHR with a note of muscle pain, but there's no explicit note of an office visit that the provider did not prescribe the statin because of that allergy intoler intolerance, can that be used as an exception? Hi, so um, there would need to be documentation um, specific to the reason why the statin wasn't prescribed for the patient. Um, so you would need to have that documentation tying the allergy to being the reason that the statin wasn't prescribed for the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question that says, can we get clarification about order filing of fee-for-service or traditional Medicare? Is it necessary for Medicare to be primary? If so, does it need to be primary throughout the whole measurement period? Uh, hi, this is Prince from RTI. Uh, if the primary uh, coverage was Medicare fee-for-service for the entire measurement period, there would be no reason to disqualify a patient from the sample. Any patient with supplemental coverage should not be disqualified on the basis of having supplemental coverage. If the primary coverage was Medicare Advantage or not a Medicare coverage, including Medicaid, for at least some portion of the measurement period, then it would be appropriate to disqualify a patient from the sample. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Angie, going back to you for a question, for patients who have multiple multiple diagnosis for an advanced illness and fragility, but do not meet the age requirement of 66 and older and are not palliative or hospice, is there another way to exclude the measure, exclude when the measure doesn't allow any medical exceptions? Hi. Um, the patient would have to meet those age requirements to use those uh, denominator exclusions. And if they don't fit any of the denominator exclusions in the measure, um, but you feel they um, should not be included in the population for the measure, then you could uh, apply for a other CMS approved reason um, and to ask to skip that patient if you feel they shouldn't be there. Um, you can find those instructions um, in each of the measure specifications um, toward the beginning, usually during the patient confirmation or denom denominator confirmation section, and um, go ahead and apply for the approved reason. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just reading here and losing my train of thought, but yes, um, that is done. Um, I'm very sorry. Um, Katie, I'm trying to figure out the name of the, is there the tool for the skips that they have to access or is it in the web interface tool? It is a different tool, um, but the instructions are in the measure specifications. Thank you so much. Right. And Deb, going to you for a couple of questions. For HTN2, if the last reading of the year was elevated and taken at an urgent care visit pertaining to a broken bone and, patient, and the patient was in pain, can we exclude that reading? Um, no, you should not be excluding that reading. Um, basically, I would suggest, you know, kind of looking at page six of the posted specification. It does give you a listing of um, blood pressure readings that should not be included. Um, but in this particular case, if that is your most recent blood pressure documented in the medical record and urgent care visits are considered um, visits that, that you should be 
submitting the blood pressure readings for, um, you would either need to use that blood pressure reading or if you feel like at that point you would prefer to open up a CMS-approved reason to skip um, and see if they will allow you to skip that patient, that would be your only other option. Um, but you should not be just excluding that patient's blood pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And one more question. If the documentation does not state if the, the VP device is digital or non-digital, can we assume one or the other, or does it not count? Um, basically, and I, and I know folks have heard this um, for different questions, but due to the comprehensive and individual nature of the patient medical record, only available to the CMS web interface users, CMS can't provide specific feedback regarding whether or not documentation in the medical record, including screenshots, scenarios, or internal policies would meet the intent of the measure or suffice for a given measure in the event of an audit. Um, in the event of an audit, auditors will review measure specifications in comparison to the patient medical record documentation provided by a group, virtual group, or APM entity, including a shared savings program, ACO, for each patient sampled for the audit. So in this particular case, I would not want you to make any assumptions. Um, you really need to look at your medical record documentation and determine whether or not um, what you have documented meets the intent of the measure. Thank you. Thank you. And Angie, one question for you. Does positive fall screen qualify for frailty? Um, hi. No, a a um a care, I'm sorry, a positive screening would not would not apply and again you would need to check the um the frailty codes included in the denominator exclusion codes in the coding document for the measure you are reporting thank you great thank you and deb we did get someone asking for clarification or further clarification for HTN2 with the last specialist visit of the year that has no blood pressure taken, I believe I am to enter, enter yes to HTN diagnosis and then no to the question, was the patient, patient's most recent blood pressure taken? I'm confused why, I'm confused why to, you said to look up for another blood pressure documentation. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Um, First of all, if, if you um, look at page 10 of the Hypertension 2 measure specification, um, the steps that are provided there, you're going to determine if the patient's most recent blood pressure was documented during the measurement period. So you stated that the, the last visit is a specialty visit with no blood pressure documented. So in this case, you're looking for the most recent blood pressure that has been documented. If there was no blood pressure documented at that specialist visit, you would want to look for the most recent blood pressure documented to use for this measure. If you said that the, blood, the patient's blood pressure measurement was not documented, you're saying it was not documented um, during the measurement period at all. You're not finding any blood pressure documented. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that that's not what you would want to answer, that what you're really looking for is you've confirmed denominator eligibility. Um, you're looking to be able to hopefully confirm that that patient's blood pressure is under control, um, or obviously if, it, if it's not under control, that information will end up being provided as you record the date of the most recent blood pressure, as well as the systolic and diastolic blood pressure that's been documented. Um, but if there's anything else we can provide for clarity, please just go ahead and, and ask a, 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 the question again, and I will try to, to provide additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, okay, Jamie, a question came through for you about PREV-10. The patient is a current everyday smoker, declined to station counseling, but we provide documented quitting tobacco care instructions at the office visit. We did not code or charge for the education. Does this meet that criteria, that measure? So thanks for this question. Um, as far as the intent of the measure, tobacco cessation intervention is 
defined as includes brief counseling, three minutes or less, and or pharmacotherapy. As long as the documentation within the medical record is aligning with the intent of the definition here, it doesn't even mean that the patient has to follow through. It just has to be provided once they're identified as a tobacco user. Then, and it's in your medical record and it's documented, then you would be meeting the intent of that measure. As far as the specific type of documentation that you would use to identify or communicate that within the chart, I, I cannot speak to that. I can only provide the intent of the measure. Thanks so much. Great, and thank you. It, um, just a reminder for folks, if you do want to ask a question, um, you can do so through the audio. So go ahead and raise your hand. The button should be at the bottom of your screen and we will unmute your line. Um, and you can also submit questions through the Q&A box. Um, and it looks like we did just get one more for PREV 10 is smoking enough to satisfy the screening as in past years or must we find the documentation for all tobacco that is include both smoking and non-smoking tobacco use. Yeah, thanks for this question too. I do appreciate it. Um, we, again, we can't really comment on what specifically what is uh, charted within your medical record, just that it, it's meeting the intent of the measure um, and that when you're looking at it, it's gonna translate to those that may also additionally look um, in the case of an audit. So you can use whatever you want to, to identify those patients when screened, if they're users, non-users, smokers, <laughs> It really is up to the organization and how they want to chart that within the medical record. The measure, it doesn't provide that type of guidance. So as long as whatever you're seeing documented within that medical record is meeting the intent of the measure, um, then that would suffice um, and be applicable. If there's any other questions, please just let us know. Great, and shifting back over to, to the phone lines, Rick um, Bukowski, we have unmuted your line. Um, you can go ahead and unmute on your end and ask your question. And Rick, it looks like, oh, you may have just unmuted. And Rick, you can go ahead and ask your question if you're ready. Olivia, quick question. I know that we're waiting to see if Rick is available or is able to unmute for his question, but um, I would like to address some, some other questions in the chat relating to the Excel template and, and the updates, if that's okay. So as I noted, there were updates to the Excel template and the Excel template with sample data. There's questions about if someone is actually using the actual sample file that they received, not specific to ACO. So ACOs received um, a sample file or, um, or the sample files were uploaded to the web interface and were available in the actual web interface application itself. So I'm actually going to ask Stephen from our product team to address the dynamic in terms of the Excel templates versus the actual like sample data that was uploaded in the web interface for um, for, for the users. Steven? Yep. Um, so the data that you are downloading from the web interface um, with your sample population that you are reporting is correct. Uh, there was no updates to anything along those lines. The updates were specific to um, the resource library where there is a template and a template filled with sample data where it's not your sample data, it's just generic information that has been filled out within there. Um, so if you are download, have you downloaded your uh, sample from the web interface and are using that for reporting, there are no issues with any of the data that you have downloaded or would be reported.
Thanks, Stephen. Okay. Perfect. And it looks like Rick is having some audio issues. So we'll shift back to some written questions that we have received. Um, Deb, a question for you for care measure two, for care, care two measure, excuse me. If a fall screen is performed at an outside location or facility, different TIN, and we have documentation in the medical record of the fall screen, will this meet the measure? So as long as you have medical record documentation um, of a fall screen, then you have met the intent of the measure. Thank, Thank you, you, Deb. And we did get a question asking you to clarify about the response to a CMS audit question. Um, this person said, did I hear correctly that the screenshots of the EMR record will not be sufficient to support the data submitted to CMS with the patient's medical record? Can you elaborate what the process will look like if CMS did choose a group entity or ACO for the audit? Yes, and I did want to clarify, I can't provide any information on the process, um, but I did want to clarify that the response that I provided was specific to a question asking about the hypertension 2 measure and whether or not an assumption of um, a digital or non-digital blood pressure um, cuff was used. And so that was very specific to, to providing guidance um, for the hypertension 2 question about um, their, their assumptions and, and the medical record documentation, which again, we can't, due to the comprehensive nature of the medical records, we really can't speak to, to certain things that are documented. Um, that was not intended to be um, a response to the auditing or, or potential auditing. So again, very specific to the hypertension 2 question. Thank you. Thank you. And Katie, shifting to a couple of questions for you. For PREV 13, is a diagnosis of familial hypercholesteremia alone enough to qualify patients for the measure, or does it require an LDLC is equal to or greater than 190 as well? So this is related to um, population, um, excuse me, population two. Um, within the denominator. So this one is an OR statement. So it's patients greater than or equal to 20 years at the beginning of the measurement period who have ever been had a laboratory result of LDLC greater than or equal to 190 or were previously diagnosed with or currently have an active diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. So um, they don't have to meet both of those, it's either the LDLC greater than or equal to 190 or the history of or active diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. A couple other questions for you. Um, one reads, can you review what counts as depression follow-up for the depression screening measure? Sure, I can do that. The um, page six, and seven of the PREV-12 measure specification provide a bit more detail, um, but just at a high level, um, a documented follow-up plan for a positive depression screening must include one or more of the following, and that is a referral to a provider for additional evaluation and assessment to formulate a follow-up plan for a positive depression screen, pharmacological interventions, and other interventions or follow-up for the diagnosis or treatment of depression. And then page seven goes into a little bit more detail about um, what the, how those follow-up plans should be documented and um, provides examples of um, what a clinician could potentially do in follow-up. And if you have additional questions, you can always um, submit a help desk ticket at QPP at cms.hhs.gov. Thank you. Great. And we did get a question on PREV 13, risk number three population. Does a diabetes diagnosis have to specify the type in the EHR or can just diabetes in the appropriate diagnosis code be sufficient? 
So a combination of coding and medical record documentation would be appropriate um, documentation. And in this instance, um, the type 2 diabetes without complication is present in the PREV 13 coding document. So um, that would be appropriate, um, again, with the coding and the medical record documentation. Thanks. Great, and Deb, going back to you um, for some clarification for HTN2, if medical record shows during a care coordination call that a patient reports, patient reported blood pressure with an electronic device, would this count? I know you have mentioned that manual blood pressure should not be included. My question is related to patient report for a per personal electronic device, not a remote monitoring device. Yeah, so, um... I'm going to give you some of the information that we currently have, but if this does not completely answer your question, please, um, we, we encourage you to open up a ServiceNow case so that we can provide you additional guidance. Um, as the measure specifications do not define a remote monitoring device, um, it is really at the clinician's responsibility and at their discretion to confirm whether or not the remote monitoring device or device that was used to obtain the blood pressure is considered acceptable and reliable. Um, so if you need additional information, certainly um, you can ask another question and I'll try and provide um, more detail or if you feel like there's information that, that is not currently being provided and you want to open up a ServiceNow case, um, we will be able to address it in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And Jamie, shifting to one question for you, has the 24 month look back period been removed for PREV 10? Um, and the quick answer is yes, because we're running out of time. So just a quick recap on what that looks like currently for this measure in 2022. And we're talking about PREV 10, is that um, patients that are aged 18 years and older who are screened for tobacco use one or more times within the measurement period, and then for that cessation counseling, for those that are identified as tobacco users, you're going to be able to um, either provide that tobacco cessation intervention on the day of the encounter or look within the previous 12 months. Thanks. Great. Angie, a question came through for you. For DM2, if A1C cannot not be patient reported, how can it be possible to report A1C in a telemedicine visit? Hi, um, it is correct that patient uh, home testing and reported results of that type should not be included. Um, we can't really speak to how the patient interacts with the clinician during a telehealth encounter, but one example the team did discuss is it's possible that the patient may provide the clinician with their HbA1c results from a lab uh, during such encounter, whether that be um, verbally or through a patient portal, that type of thing. Um, but the patient reported or self-taken HbA1cs shouldn't be used. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we are coming up on time, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Deb, one question for you. For CARE 2, would documentation of ambulating normally be meet the intent of the measure? I know this is going to sound like a broken record, but some of these things we cannot specifically address. However, the CARE 2 measure specification does define a screening for fall risk as an assessment of whether an individual has experienced a fall or problems with gait or balance. If your medical record documentation supports that the patient was assessed with gait or balance, the intent of the measure has been met. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And I think we have time for one final question for you, Katie. For PREV-12 depression screen, if patient has muscular dystrophy and unable to speak, should the screen be skipped since it won't be completed or does this qualify as an exception? So while there's not a specific exception um, for a particular diagnosis, if there's medical record documentation um, of a reason for not screening a patient for depression due to cognitive, functional, or motivational limitations that may impact the accuracy of the results, um, it 
would be appropriate to report the denominator exception. Um, but again, just to reiterate, you would have to have a specifically documented that they weren't screened um, due to um, their diagnosis, condition, et cetera. Um, if you don't have that level of documentation, it could potentially be an option to submit a other CMS approved reason, um, but we would likely ask for additional information um, regarding the circumstances of um, that particular patient in their situation. Thank you. And Olivia, before we conclude today's presentation, um, I also, I'm just gonna ask Stephen just to repeat, because we're getting still questions in the chat with regard to the resources that we made changes to, and those are templates that we made changes to, but we didn't make changes to the actual application of the web interface itself or the portal. So, Stephen, would you just repeat your response again for that? Sure. Um, so, the information that was up, updated is only on the resource library. So, the information um, is just generalized templates, um, not the data that you are actually accessing and downloading through the, through the, um, the web interface itself, where you are receiving your patients um, and your sample and what you could be using to actually report um, via the Excel. Nothing from that perspective has changed. All of the data in production has been um, the same since we have opened reporting. Um, it is still valid. There are no issues with any of the data that you would be getting from the web interface itself. Um, the updates that we have made are only two documents that are in the resource library that are through the unauthenticated experience. Um, you don't need to be logged in. So if you just went to qpp.cms.gov and went to the resource library and looked for the documentation, um, in the resource library, that is where the updates have, have occurred. Um, but again, nothing within the web interface that has been available since submission open has changed and there is no issue with that data. Thanks, Stephen. All right, I will conclude today's call. So thank you all for joining us. As a reminder, the slide deck recording and transcript from today's call will be available on the QPP webinar library within the next two weeks. Our next support call is scheduled for Wednesday, February 22nd from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern time, during which we will cover frequently asked measure questions pertaining to PREV 10 and CARE 2. We hope you will join us. This concludes today's support call. Thank you again and have a great day. Take care.